Okay, well, I'll start. Um, hello, everybody, and um, welcome to today's session. Um, we're delighted to have a great attendance from around the world. Um, just to say that the webinar is being recorded now and it'll be made available um, with closed captions on the Library Publishing SIGS web space and on YouTube. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Reggie Raju to start. If you could give us some opening remarks, Reggie. Uh, thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, greetings to you. Um, as one of the conveners of the Library Publishing Special Interest Group of IFLA, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. It is unfortunate that Anne Okerson, the other convener and mentor, is not able to join us today. She does uh, wish us well for this webinar. I would like to take a few minutes to talk about the SIG itself, which advocates for the expansion of library services to include a library publishing service. The focus of this growing special interest group is to advance librarianship as it relates to library publishing activities. In advancing librarianship, library publishing provides alternatives for the dissemination of scholarship for the dissemination of literature. The goal of the SIG is to share information about library publishing and practices around the world with the objective of contributing to IFLA's global vision opportunities in championing, in championing access to information, updating traditional roles, serving our communities, and serving as advocates for libraries' central role in society. A significant element of library publishing is, is the desire to advance open access, as well as to meet local needs related to the creation and dissemination of scholarship. It is difficult to ignore the impact of COVID on library activities. COVID-19 has and continues to be a major disruptor to the delivery of library services. The pandemic has brought to the fore the desperate need to openly share scholarship when physical access to university libraries are a challenge. Irrespective of where you come from, access to information resources is already a major challenge. The pandemic adds another layer of complexity. Be that as it may, COVID-19 has highlighted the fact that libraries need to move beyond traditional roles of purchasing and distributing scholarly literature. Librarians need to be strategic to need to strategically position themselves and take ownership of, of improving access to scholarly a new level of urgency to transform the communication, scholarly communication process. In a post-COVID era, there are enormous opportunities for an expanded and inclusive library publishing service, which addresses anywhere, anytime access to knowledge and literature. It is most unfortunate that we could not, and again, it's because of the pandemic, we could not have done this program live at the Congress. But be that as it may, the rich discussions that will take place this evening will stimulate the drive to make library publishing a mainstream service within libraries. As librarians, our core responsibilities have always been to collect information resources, to organize it, and that is to catalog it and place them on the shelves, and then to disseminate those information resources through circulation 
and loans processes. In library publishing, it is proposed that the librarian retain their fundamental epistemologies, but reimagine the, such epistemologies with the collection of information resources being re-envisioned through, through assisting editors to solicit uh, article submissions and to organize the information resources through its placement in to an issue, a journal issue or a journal volume, and then disseminate that through publication. This webinar comprises of seven short presentations on library publishing case studies and collaborations. The diversity of the presentation, diversity in terms of geography, diversity in terms of experiences, makes for a, an information rich webinar. We have presentations from the Philippines, Russia, Nigeria, Germany, Turkey, Canada, and the United States. So we, we, have, we also have diversity in experience and collectively it makes for an excellent webinar. On behalf of Anne and I, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to Jane and the team for the hard work in putting uh, this webinar together. It will be remiss of me not to acknowledge uh, Robert Alphys and Lisha Dara for their invaluable technical and administrative support. We also thank Megan Price from the IFLA headquarters for her invaluable help. In closing, I, want, I would like to welcome you all and wish you well in your deliberations in this webinar. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, Jane. Thank you, Reggie. Um, so um, we'd love to hear from all of you um, throughout the, uh, the webinar, um, but we'll save the actual questions, addressing the questions until the end of each session. There are, as um, Reggie said, two sessions. We're starting with case studies, and then afterwards we'll have collaborations in library publishing. So please ask questions through the Q&A function and make comments through the chat, and uh, we'll get to as many as possible um, when the time comes. And finally, the Twitter hashtag for the event is hashtag IFLA underscore LibPub. So please get busy. I know librarians are, are great tweeters. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. Giannina Cabania is from the University of the Philippines College of Law. And her presentation is entitled An Analysis of the Publishing Business Plan for the uh, University of the Philippines College of Law Information and Publication Division. So we welcome Giannina. Hi, thank you, Jane. Um, so I will be presenting briefly about the publishing business plan of the University of the Philippines College of Law, um, uh, IP for Information and Publication Division. So I'm going to share. My screen right now. We can't see the uh, the slides yet. Oh, okay. So basically, um, the information and publication division of the um, of the UP College of Law focuses on a framework uh, which determines uh, certain viability for monetizing a product. For example, some of the publications which includes uh, textbooks. Um, um, journals, for example, which address the needs of our academic communities. Um, and then um, like uh, any other uh, business venture also, um, 
the IPD also publishes and develops a clear um, service model or a business plan which um, creates a uh, shared expectations for the entire college funding streams and we also have quality markers to follow and also we have our own technical staffs and also have professional development programs for our staff so the anatomy of the business um, uh, publishing plan um, will be presented and it also includes some of the principles of the program for example, of scopes of services and some of the staffing requirements. And some of the other aspects also include like uh, policies, uh, financial structures, and some measures of the success of the business plan of the uh, IPD. So um, some of the budget models that we have for the information and publication division is actually um, in particular, we receive majority of our funding from the state appropriations because we are a state university some come from the tuition fees and some from grant awards. So basically, um, majority of our funding is uh, received from state appropriation because we are a state university. So there are two types. Basically, um, one is all funds, which emphasizes um, a holistic goals um, oriented perspective, meaning like uh, it takes into account all sources of revenue and expenses and um, it also facilitates um, monitoring of resource allocations in pursuit of our institutional goals. So what is the potential effect of that on our publishing programs? Basically, um, um, cost recovery income may be considered revenue, but it is in a scoop type process. Another form of um, budget model is also the initiative based, which is like several uh, offices in the, in the College of Law apply to a pool to support new initiatives in relation to publication. So um, basically the potential effect of that on our program is um, some have to be uh, self-funded and they have to do cost recovery activities um, depending on the type of project that they have and if the funding would be one time or versus recurring, okay? And then another part of the business plan is actually content creation as a service. So we always aim to provide access to all content, to all patrons, which seem to be free from barriers, especially for the academic community. So the Institute actually was established uh, since 1963, and we have always sought to make the law more accessible to the students, law practitioners, government agencies and administrators and also some readers in line with the law center's public service mandate okay so we publish different types of materials studies monographs research papers um, articles works on timely legal issues um, written by respected uh, philippine legal experts and educators as well as internationally recognized um, authors Okay, so all of these are made affordable and um, are also made reference materials from the Philippines top law schools. And some of them are peer reviewed materials by internationally recognized authors. And we also publish um, bar examination review um, books um, and questionnaires. So it's actually the content creation as a service is actually holistic law scholarship. So um, from experts in the field. So. We have several types of um, textbook writing projects, different publications, which you can check at the University, um, College of Law website, which is www.uplaw.edu.ph. And then you just look for the publications um, uh, tab and you feel free to search all of the publications there and um, the process that we do and also have uh, contacts there like email, landline and everything else. So we have several projects for the publication IPD, which runs like uh, every year. Some of these are called the Centennial Textbook Writing Project. So um, it's actually the benchmark series of the publication. It offers um, law students textbooks and reference materials from written by the faculty, uh, which is also the premier law school of the Philippines, University of Philippines College of Law. So these are like um, com comprehensive series um, covers which uh, covers um, subjects in legal education and it also offers an in-depth analysis of uh, law in the local context which is in the Philippines. 
So it has released uh, definitive volumes, different types of volumes, and it has always been, it has always become indispensable for the study of the Philippine law. Okay, and it also was issued in line in celebration of the College of Law's 100 years as a leading institution in legal education in the Philippines. Okay, so yep. So since 2011, since it was it was launched, the project has produced um, insightful books that have become indispensable for the study of the Philippine law. So next part of the publication plan is actually the publishing program. So. Um, we operate within the same office as the University of the Philippines College of Law Press. So we have a separate press from the University of the Philippines as a whole. Okay, so the press that we have reports um, administratively to our office and it also functions as a traditional college or university press. So it is also, uh, it also serves as an institutional repository. So some of the principles of our publishing program is actually um, Publishing services staff are experts in the scholarly publishing field. Another um, part of the publishing program is the scope and eligibility, which uh, focuses on print and electronic forms of publication. Um, another part of the program is the staffing and financials. So we um, also seek uh, services of external vendors when needed. And uh, another part of the publishing program is also the funding and sources. So um college operating budget 50 percent of that comes from the budget of the ipd and then the sales and hosting revenue 30 percent we get from that and we also get chargebacks of 20 percent okay and then the last um, part of the publishing program is how do we develop and produce our services so we also offer a full suite of services for our publishing programs especially um hosting editing typesetting design formatting, uh, formatting, uh, for example, PDF, EPUB, OCRs. We also do digitization, web design, preservation. Our office is also in charge for the maintenance of the website of the entire college. Um, prints on demand and some charges also apply depending on the type of service that they will have Okay, But if it's requested by the office, it's uh, free of charge. So. Another type of publication that we do also is we also have um, journals, which is also peer review. So we use a call for proposals to solicit publications. So one is called the Philippine Law Review, and we use a platform and workflow, which is called the PKP OJS. So if you want to check out the Philippine Law Review, it's available online. You can visit it at phlawreview.org slash index.php or just search for Philippine Law Review online. So it's actually the country's uh, first online peer-reviewed law journal for faculty and legal professionals. So it's still a platform that provides uh, scholarship and um, advanced legal topics. Um, it's also led by editorial staff um, of professors coming from the leading law schools across the country. So yes, so the platform that we're using here is open source. So it's the PKP and it also is the open journal system. It's actually an open source um, journal uh, source of application for managing and publishing scholarly journals. So there you go. So we also publish different types of, um, um, aside from the Philippine Law Review, we have our own citation manual, which is called the Maroon Manual. So you can also search it online. Um, it's from the University of the Philippines College of Law. And then we also have the Philippine Law Journal. So the Philippine Law Journal that we issued uh, in January 2020, it's a special issue which focuses um, the cases of coronavirus diseases, diseases that happened in the Philippines. Um, or, so um, there are actually a number of confirmed cases already since that um, January 2020, and it has formed part of a global pandemic, which has changed the everyday lives of Filipinos, especially in the law community in the Philippines. So um, it is in line with the journal's commitment to um, uh, promote relevant and timely legal scholarship. So it's a special online feature, so it can be accessed online for free. And uh, it features COVID-19 and the law, which is a compilation of legal essays discussing how the pandemic has shaped and has shaped various aspects of the law. 
So the Philippine Law Journal, by the way, was established since uh, 1940. So it's the oldest English uh, language law review actually in Asia. So yes, so it publishes uh, four issues every year, right? And um, uh, what else about the publishing program? Yes, um, aside from that, we also have a faculty scholarship series, which you can check on the website of the AP College of Law also. So um, again, showcases this uh, legal expertise of the members of the college. And um, uh, most of it is uh, in a single theme bound volume. So the series actually provides access to the extended discussions of important legal issues again, to help form the discourses of whatever is affected in the Philippine law. So we also have um, publications about the bar examination questions, which covers all sub subjects in the bar examinations in the Philippines. So um, how do they um, publish that? So the answers in B each bar subject are discussed and prepared by a select uh, group of law professors and practitioners, and um, they're experts and authorities in each subject. And uh, after the answers are finalized by a group or committee, the suggested answers are transmitted to the chairman of the Supreme Court Bar Examinations Committee of the Philippines and who turn furnishes copies to the examiners. Okay, so there we go. Thank you very much. And um, another publication that um, we have also is the uh, um, National Administrative Register. All right. So it contains uh, certified rules and regulations filed by the different government agencies of the university um, at the university law center. Okay. And um, these are also adopted by the different government agencies. So actually all the government agencies are required to file their registers uh, with the ONAR, National Administrative Register, which is also a house of the University of the Philippines, which is provided by the Ad Administrative Code of 1987. Okay, so going back to the publishing program, I think it's already the last uh, slide. Um, so we focus now on the rights. So part of the publishing program that we have is discussing about um, rights, meaning uh, what are the different channels of, of communication that we use that encourage um, publication editors to reach out for support. For example, for our office, we normally use Microsoft Teams for that, and also our emails, official email addresses for the university. And then for the distribution and marketing policies, the majority of um, published content that we have is openly accessible to the academe. And also we have a bookstore online and on site in the college, which uh, sells print copies of the author. And we also have um, the author is also the copyright holder. And um, one of the policies of being of publishing with us is that they cannot set up their own digital store funded books. All has to be um, coursed through the college, which is through the IPV. Another part is the um, preservation policy. So we always have our website and the production files are always preserved. Version of record copies are also preserved in PDF. We have our separate server, of course, for that. And for the financial matter, um, we always take into account ident identifiers such as DOIs, ISSN, and ISBNs. So we take charge of that for publication that we um, we get. And then um, other other financial concerns about our publishing program, aside from the core technologies or digital publishing platforms, is we also maintain a graphic design software for individual publications. Those are the special ones. And then we also allocate funding for um, marketing and pro promotion and uh, some licenses uh, for production tools, such as, you know, the publishing of um, software and application, InDesign, Authenticate, Overleaf, the Adobe Suite, um, everything. And um, I think the next slide, the last slide will cover, yeah. So three things that we have always consider when we do our publishing um, uh, business plan is sustainability. So basically we have that. So the technology that we use has always been meeting our publication needs and we are always upgrading. And um, almost all publishing staff are able to maintain develop workflows, especially now that we have um, the pandemic going on, we have transition fully to online. Most of our services has been transitioned to online workflows. And um, 
How about scalability? There is, has always been a growth in the number of publications because um, some of the publications that we have have started as early as 1963 and we have transitioned from print to online and it has been growing ever since. And then there are always additional services being added as requested, such as um, we are establishing a platform for selling eBooks, especially for our faculty and students. And then how about the visibility? Yes, there is campus awareness of our publication, the public of um, the IPD itself and the services that we have. The entire campus, not just the Diliman campus, but the University of the Philippine System has been aware of the publishing program of the IPD UP College of Law ever since. I think that ends my presentation. And if you have questions, you can send them to geocabanuya at up.edu.ph. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. And um, we had a bit of an issue with your with your slides, so we'll, uh, Robert is going to share them in the chat so that, that yes. people can have them as a Thank takeaway. You. So, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ekaterina Shebeva from the Russian State Library. Um, the title of her presentation, which is co-written with Dr. Ekaterina uh, Nikonorova, is Publishing to Inspire the Library Profession. So. Thank you, Ekaterina. Um, Ekaterina, you need to unmute Ekaterina. Uh, could you see my presentation? Thank you. Uh, just a second. Um, first of all, um, let me beg my pardons from my uh, course author and my boss, Ekaterina Nikanorova. She is the director of our publishing house, uh, publishing house uh, named Pashkov Dom of the uh, Russian State Library. And uh, she is teaching students the very same time on another Zoom uh, line. And um, she is also the head of the section of publishing and book distribution of the uh, Russian Library Association. This um, uh, section is very close for to the IFLAS on library publishing by the thematic. Uh, about my, few words about myself. I'm working in the Pashkov Dom Publishing House, uh, working for period, periodical departments. And then later you will see what it is about. Uh, the, uh, our presentation is about inspiring. Um, sorry, I need to move a bit. Uh, and first let me say, uh, share a few uh, numbers. The publishing activities of Russian libraries has not yet been studied in detail. However, the All Russian Library Congress, which was held in Tula last year, attempted to make the first review of general trends in the market of library publications. Let me share with you some facts and figures. In 2016, the Russian Book Chamber registered more than uh, 400 library publications, books and brochures. In 2017, it was about around 300. In 18, more than 400 publications. This is about half a percent of the total numbers of all, all publications issued in country. And we think this is a, quite a significant amount. Uh, it is important to know that publishing is essential for libraries of all levels. Therefore, even for rural libraries, publishing efforts plays a considerable role as it is improved the image of library, makes a significant contribution to preservation of cultural heritage of the region, and becomes a bridge uh, in the transfer of accumulated knowledge to society. In addition, it is a manifestation of creativity and creative initiatives that en enrich the meaning of life for librarians. Large libraries on federal uh, level or central libraries of the region usually publish methodological literature. The topics of popularization of library collection is one of priority for most of publishing libraries. Uh, it is implemented uh, in the form of catalogs of items stored in the library's collection. It also uh, uh, could include bibliographical indexes, collections, digests, recommendation lists, and so on. Regional libraries 
often find partners to publish thematic collections related to famous authors who lived in the region. Thus, both area studies and local uh, lower literature are taken into account. Advertising and marketing products, as well as stationery, also play a vital role in publishing activities of all types of libraries. It could be bookmarks, calendars, notebooks, souvenirs, so on. All these productions serve not only for users' need, but to inspire librarians in their everyday work. Now, a few words about our library. The Russian State Library is the national library. It holds more than 47 million items in holdings. Uh, being the founder of the Pashkov Dom Publishing House, the Russian State Library is one of the leading library publishers in Russia. For more than 20 years, the library has published more than 500 books. Uh, main areas of publishing activities are the following. It's popularizations of funds of our library. Uh, here in the presentation, you can see just some examples. Publication of catalogs and bibliographic indexes. Publications of research results. We have uh, many research uh, uh, staff. And publication about history of the Russian style library. Uh, of course, publication for library science and bibliology professionals, both uh, fundamental and methodological. Uh, the Russian State Library produced two research peer-reviewed journals, aiming to distribute new research results that inspire the library profession. The Bibliotheca Vidinia, Russian Journal of Library Science, provides scholarly and original research and sources about the library within the cultural landscape. Uh, the Observatory of Culture journal shows philosophical and cultural approaches to the library profession. It works on advocating for libraries through culture on a global and regional level. We have three more journals, uh, Herald of the Library Assembly of Eurasia, Newsletter of IFLA, we published it in digital form in Russian language, and libraries of the new generation. It's a new journal which aims to support the governmental national project culture in case of modernization of municipal libraries. Libraries from all over the world are presented on our pages, from national to rural libraries, from the cases uh, from 19th century to the most modern libraries. All the cases show the strong depends on library development from the cultural context and support the main idea that researching the library field should be firmly based in cultural studies. As you can see, Russian State Library has extensive experience and skills in publishing research results. And last year, we decided to compare our publication activities with the international one. For this, we carried out the bibliometric analysis of the different journals in library science. You can see them on the slide in order to identify and identify most interesting topics. Uh, here you can see the table with the results and uh, uh, you can see that our Russian journal Biblioteca Vedinia published the article that can be attributed to most of the presented topics in the international journals. However, most often uh, they are written with another presentation style and structure of the text, as well as different approach to conducting research. We also uh, used in our analysis uh, world clouds, aiming to compare the metadata of the Russian Bibliotheca Vedini Journal and the Journal of Librarianship and Information Science published by SAGE uh, for the time period you see on slide. As you can see, the word information is more strong for international journal. And for Russian, uh, the main one is library. We also see that the appearance among the worlds of the Bibliotheca Vedin Journal on such concepts as culture, history, and book demonstrate a certain attitude to library as cultural phenomenon. Uh, so we see that difference between Russian and international journals depend not only and not so much on the uh, collision of traditional and modern vision of the library and information science, but rather on deeper uh, reasons based on cultural differences. Uh, more information about uh, all these researches could be written in an article which is uh, published in the 
bottom of this uh, slide. Um, concluding our presentation, we should point a few things. First, uh, we uh, strongly understand that all library needs publishing activities for inspiration of staff and uh, users of the library. We support the idea of IFLA Special Interest Group on Library Publishing on creating database of such libraries, of publishing libraries. This will inspire uh, to continue uh, this work and show to publishing libraries that they are not alone in their work. Uh, the third, libraries all around the world are publishing and researching the very close topics, but, but uh, they are using different presentation style with different approaches based on uh, cultural differences. We need to study each other's experience uh, uh, to be inspired for further development. Uh, so we suggest to think on creating a joint information resource where it could be uh, find all or most of uh, results of publishing activities of libraries. This will serve as a source of inspiration in finding new forms, themes and approaches to research and publishing. We hope that future cooperation between publishing libraries in Russia and in other countries will be growing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. So our next, um, we'd now like to welcome uh, Dr. Aishat Egbunu from the University of Abuja and Dr. Ngozi Ukachi from the University of Lagos. And their presentation today is entitled Library Publishing as an Essential Function in Today's World, Models and Sustainability Plans by Academic Libraries in Nigeria. So welcome to you both. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Ngazi Okachi, I'll be presenting uh, on behalf of the two of us like um the Moretta has rightly said the presentation our presentation is titled library publishing as an essential function in today's information world are model you, sorry are you sharing yeah, i'm going to share my screen So I'm, I'm sharing my screen. I'm, I'm sure we are seeing the screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Um, publishing, as we all know, as library and information managers, is part of the key roles that we are expected to carry out as information disseminators. Um, prior to the um, invention of internet and the ICT facilities, library had always done this in their usual traditional way. And that is why in some libraries, we see things like indexes, some publish um, abstracts. We also publish um, you know, subject related uh, bibliographies. So publishing as a role of libraries is not just an imagined thing. It is something that has been in existence even prior to the advent of technologies. However, the adoption of technology in publishing processes had drastically reduced the stress associated with this practice. We can conveniently and easily carry out this practice with less stress, unlike how it used to be in the past. And this had drastically led to the rise in library publishing. This has paved way for libraries to be involved in publishing lots of things and in varying formats, which includes both print and electronic formats. Generally, 
there's a belief that the rise in library publishing is making the libraries as well as the associated institutions to be more visible. And at the same time, it is equally heightening their contribution and relevance in the information world, is making them to achieve outstanding results, helping them to achieve outstanding results in the scholarly world. In as much as these benefits are being noticed or are becoming more obvious, there is also still this fear and curiosity among librarians about the sustainability of the varying publishing activities that we're getting ourselves involved in today. And that brings us to the reason why this study was carried out. This study is actually carried out with a main focus of establishing procedures that should be put in place for the sustainability of library publishing activities in Nigeria and some other developing nations. We know that some developed nations might not be having the kind of problems that the developing ones are having at the moment. So the focus is to find out, to establish what are the sustainability plans that we are putting in place to ensure that we will not just publish for some time and then stop. Now, the specific objectives are, the first one is to identify the specific publishing activities that these institutions are carrying out or these libraries are carrying out. To establish the view of librarians on the relevance of establishing these publishing activities. What actually is pushing them into doing it? What actually are they thinking are the benefits that will accrue from getting themselves involved in these activities. Now, the next one will be to identify the challenges encountered in carrying out these activities. Because it is obvious that there would be some challenges that will be encountered in the process. Now, we equally want to look at the areas that technological tools are adopted in carrying out these activities. And then finally, find out the subset sustainability plan put in place by the libraries for carrying out this activity. Now, what my aunt, how is it going to, how is this study being relevant to us? Or how is it going to benefit us? Sincerely, it's going to benefit both the library people, the librarians, the library management, the university management, the university community, that's our users, because the emphasis of this study is on university community. Now it's going to benefit the general public and also researchers that might want to carry out future researches in this area of study. For the librarians, is going to awaken their consciousness on things that need to be put in place for the sustainability of this activity. And then for the university management, is going to create room for them to be more visible than they had always been. Because if the libraries affiliated to them engage in several publishing activities and make them visible to the global world, definitely their visibility level will be increasing. Then the general public will also be availed of the opportunity of gaining access to information that wouldn't have been made available to them if these activities are not carried out. Now, the literature review was carried out and they will found out that there is no existing study in this area. And that was why we had to we identify that there's a gap in this area of study, and it is the need to fill that gap that prompted us into carrying out this study. Now, the methodology that was adopted is the survey research um, design was adopted, while random sampling technique was equally adopted in the study. Now, self-constructed questionnaire was the instrument that was used to collect data. Because of the coronavirus issue that wouldn't permit people to move around, we had to use the survey monkey to collect data using the various platforms where university librarians you know, are to be able to generate this. Then the data collected, we are subjected to descriptive statistical data analysis using frequency counts, percentages, mean, and standard deviation. Now, Analyzing the results, we found out that 
77.1% of the people that responded as members of staff of university libraries from the rank of librarian one and above. This means that the information that is being generated definitely are authentic because these are senior members of the library. So they know what is happening in their libraries. Now the common publishing activities that we were able to find out that take place in almost all the libraries that we studied are the orientation manual. People are now publishing their orientation manual, the library manual, the institutional repository, information literacy manual, and library journals. Libraries are getting involved. We know that prior to some time ago, the bulk of library journals we are coming from the faculties. But our study had found out, I found out that libraries nowadays equally engage themselves seriously in the production of library journals. Now, in the area of their view concerning the relevance of establishing publishing activities, we found out that they believe that it enhances the visibility of the library as well as the institution. And they also say that in order for them to be able to meet up with information needs of both the internal and external users. They also use it to complement the available materials that they have in the library. For instance, when they organize seminars or conferences, they publish this into books and sometimes also have them in electronic format and then circulate to people that might need information in the areas that those seminars or conferences covered. It is equally used to promote access and discovery of available contents, like the indexes, the abstracts that are being produced by these libraries are used as discovery tools in their libraries. It also provides guides to researchers and library users. For instance, the orientation manual, which is given to people at the registration time, helps in guiding them to be able to know what actually the library have and how to also locate them. It opens up a transparent scholarly communication environment to serve authors, and it also facilitates open access to information. So these are the things they feel that actually propelled them into venturing into these activities. Now, the areas that technologies are adopted in the publishing activities include in the area of preserving and storing of the publications. They use technology to store them. They store them in the cloud. Now, circulating information about libraries' publication to the public. They also use technology. They use social media tools to circulate this information to the public. Then it is they equally use the platform for their article submission. When authors want to submit their articles for publication in the library journals, they have a platform. These are done electronically. They use the technological tools to enable this to happen. Then the library publications are also assessed online by users. Most of the libraries that were studied made us to realize that most of their publications are assessed online in addition to the print ones that they also have in their libraries. They also use the technological tools to announce call for article submission to potential authors. When they want to announce to the public to submit articles for presentation, they use the platform and also use the editing tools provided by this technology in editing their manuscripts before they are eventually published. Now, like I talked about the challenges, the challenges that they're encountering include decline in library budgets. It is a common thing that funding has always been a problem in most developing countries. Nigeria is not left out in that. So the decline in library budget is actually affect, affecting them in the area of publishing these materials. Now, inadequate and disruptive internet access is another huge problem that is affecting us. It is affecting almost every aspect of our practice, not just the publishing aspect. And then inadequate support from the management. The management sometimes from the most institutions feel that they are not generating fund from most of these publications by the library. So they tend not to show interest in sponsoring them. So inadequate support from the management is another problem 
that is posing as a challenge to this, then the number of inadequate skilled professionals in the library, most of the people or majority of the people working in the library are not really skilled enough in the production or pub in the publishing work. So it's actually equally posing a problem. And then low patronage. It is also observed in the study that even when some of these things are produced, they receive very low patronage. People don't usually consult them or show interest, much interest in using them. Now, the sustainability plan include establishing institutional repositories so that these things, especially those that are already in print copies, could be converted into a format that it would be preserved and then made accessible to everyone. Now, creating opportunity for library staff to be involved in continuing education, like participating in work shops, conferences, seminars is another plan that they are putting in place, another thing that they do to ensure that these publishing activities are sustained. Another one that they are doing is advocating for the inclusion of library publishing course in undergraduate curriculum. So they're emphasizing and advocating that library publishing should be made a compulsory course in the undergraduate curriculum for library students. Then organization of in-house training program is another thing that they do to ensure that this particular activity, library activity is sustained. Then they also encourage librarians working with them to undertake online and distant learning programs in the area of publishing among several other things. Now, in conclusion, this study has actually established the specific activities that are carried out at the universities in the area of publishing, their views on the relevance of establishing these, the technologies adopted, challenges encountered, and establish the sustainability plan for the library publishing activities. In recommendation, we recommended based on the challenges that we observed that members of staff should be exposed to training in the area of publishing. If they are meant to acquire skills in this area, it will help a, help a great deal in ensuring that this is carried out effectively and also is sustained at the same time. Then library management should set aside a portion of library budget for publishing. And if it is not going to be very possible, considering the funding issues that they are having, they should source for alternate means of funding these activities. That this could be achieved through advertisements, enabling, advertis enabling advertisement when publishing these things. Then internet access provision should be enhanced. They should enhance the internet access availability in this library, to enhance the bandwidth. Then library management should also enlighten the university management on the need to support library publishing as it contributes in enhancing the visibility of the university, the library, and has several many other gains associated with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ngozi. Um, we, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for you afterwards. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker now, this is the, the, uh, the last uh, speaker of this session. And we welcome Dr. Ursula Arning from uh, ZB Med Information Center for Life Sciences in Germany, who will present on publishing as a library, our reasons for developing Publiso uh, publishing and advice services. Thank you, Ursula. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm really glad to be here and to present you our reasons to develop Publiso, our open access publishing and advice services. Um, who we are? I'm from the German National Library of Medicine, Healthcare, Nutritional, Environmental and Agricultural Sciences. It is a service center for research in the life sciences with application-oriented research, our discovery service, Livivo, 
and our publication portal Publiso, and very new, our COVID-19 hub. You can find it on this link there. And there you can find tools for researchers and the preprint finder. Our open access services consist of offering a repository for life sciences for text and data. The system is based on the open source system Fedora. And we have, have also been offering gold open access publishing services since 2003 in the medical field with German Medical Science, GMS, and in the field of the life sciences with Publiso since 2015. We can publish articles and meetings and also series. And there's integrated our publishing platform, Living Handbooks. We currently have 16 journals and five books and one series. And we are planning to offer our publication system to other institutions. Our platform is based on the content management system, Drupal, and its open source system. Very important for us was also the implementation of the advice services. We offer online seminars, FAQs, workshops, personal consultations by phone or sending an email, and we will respond to them as quickly as possible. All the services we offer in the field of open access, research data management and digital long-term preservation. Also networking is important for us. We go to conferences for workshops in these fields uh, or give talks. We're open for collaboration and therefore we are one of 29 members of the Association of University Presses from Germany speaking countries. We support each other with advice, and we normally present together our books and journals, also our open access or publishing advice services at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Well, the reasons we are not there this year are very obvious. So um, I can be here. And why should a library offer such services to come to our main point today? Uh, the pros are, Oh, there's a little bit mess here. Our pros are our high quality of publication with fair prices. And we are working very close together with researchers and learned societies. So we have the knowledge of them. And we can support with our services, open access and the transparency of science. And this is really our main port like a library that we say we want really to support open access. And we are giving a lot of there because the cones are mainly the costs for the development and the hosting of the infrastructure. And we can say in total the resources, human time and finances. So we say, let us work together in the development of infrastructure to support open access. And we can do it in these times all over the world. And well, it's a very short presentation, but thank you very much for your attention and feel free to ask. Thank you, Ursula. That was very interesting. Um, so um, thank you to all our speakers for their excellent and really interesting presentations. I'm going to hand you over now to Jeffrey Little, who's going to moderate the questions and answers session, and he'll introduce our poll. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, so we had uh, previously some questions uh, in the Q&A feature uh, for uh, Gia. Uh, and I think there's a question uh, for our colleague from Nigeria. Uh, and that question is, uh, what are the steps involved in digital publishing? Very broad question. Uh, and how can the library generate funding through publishing? So very much speaking, I think, to some of the recommendations that uh, uh, Ngozi made and, and some of the things that she brought up. So I'll pass that over to her and, uh, and maybe she can respond to that uh, uh, briefly. Yeah, um, if I may understand your, if I, if I got your question right, you want to know how libraries can be able to raise funds through um, publishing, right? I think I think that's that's the uh, most pertinent part of the question. I think the first part is a little broad. Uh, so so I think yes, how can uh, how can libraries generate funding through publishing, or how did how specifically have you uh, encountered that, or what are some suggestions for our, our colleagues? Um, um, coming from the marketing aspect of the whole thing, um, in as much as 
our services are usually free, uh, but I still believe that um, when you involve people to carry out advertisement, for instance, if you're doing a print publishing, you can give room for people to come and advertise their products, especially people that deal on library related things, people that sell library materials or that deal on anything that has to do with the library. You can encourage them to come and advertise their products or their services in your, um, in whatever that you're publishing. Even if it's going to be online, you can give them the opportunity of carrying out adverts and that way you will be able to generate little funding that could help you in continuing your publishing work. I don't know if you got um I think I think friends. that's I think that's a great start uh, because uh, Caitlin has a question and maybe we'll we will open it to our other uh, presenters uh, Katarina Gia Ursula uh, as well as Ngozi uh, but uh, question from Caitlin uh, curious to hear more about how libraries fund their publishing efforts generally uh, several mentioned that this is a challenge uh, but how have people met this challenge so maybe uh, Katarina if you want to maybe start and I'll I'll call on the other uh, panelists as well. <laughs> Funding is always the problem, uh, as we know. The um, library in Russian Federation, they are um, funded by uh, state or municipalities. So uh, the publishing is not the activity which is the uh, main one. So we are not allowed to, to spend the uh, budget for the uh, publishing activities. So we, we need to find partners or we need to sell books or something other to, fi to find money for publications. But uh, as uh, are most uh, those libraries who are working um, with the um, LIS uh, um, subjects, uh, so they're supporting the researchers and so on. So we could account these uh, publishing activities as the part of the research work. And uh, so this help us uh, to, to, uh, to find some uh, funds um, on this side. Uh, but also we are trying, uh, we, uh, the, the, one of the important thing is to find partners who uh, would like to uh, support, who became the friends of the library and would like to promote the um, uh, books which, uh, which uh, are in the holding of the library. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gia, do you want to add anything about uh, your experience around funding and fundraising? Yeah, yeah, I think we have a similar situation with what she said also, because, um, but we're from a state university, so basically we normally have funding every year. It's just that there is always a fund allocation for all the publishing programs that we do. And some are actually, if it's not funded by the university, it, there are some alumni members of the College of Law also like give um, specific amount to sponsor some projects also. Um, by the batches. So um, basically we have funding most of the time, but it's more dedicated to the publications that is related to the University College of Law. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, Ursula, I'll ask you to comment on that. And then there's a, there's a, a question specifically for you. So first, if you could talk about uh, your budgetary model or needs or funding. Uh, and then there's a question specifically, how do you manage the technical expertise for publications and the capacity building uh, for personnel involved uh, within this activity? So I think that speaks to uh, training for staff uh, and building those skills amongst your, uh, your colleagues. Okay, um, well, I will try. Um, the development of the infrastructure in part is funded by the German government. Um, they have different projects or funding lines, so we can ask them and obviously we have to write a lot of paper and to have a good plan how we want to develop them. And um, fortunately they have paid a lot of, uh, of this money we have required. Um, so this part of the infrastructure is um, um, paid by the um, German government and um, then the journals and the books um, we are publishing continuously 
um, they are paid by the learned societies. Um, we really work together with them. It was a decision from the learned societies of the medicine field. They said they want to publish open access and then they want to publish with us. So um, they are paying us our fees and um, the authors don't have to pay anything. Uh, well, and the other question, I... I think the question was around um, uh, training and skill development for colleagues in the library to, uh, to engage in publishing activities. Yes, this is for free. Um, this is a part of our policy or strategy. We said we are a central library in this field of medicine and life sciences. So we support the other uh, the colleagues from other libraries and we give them the trains um, without any costs. And um, the personnel is paid by the government. And the, and the staff that you work with uh, have, have existing skills in publishing or did people have to take training to learn how to do that kind of work? Some of us comes from um, editorials for publishing houses. So they know a lot from the commercial field and they decided to um, work with us. And uh, the other one, well, we give some trainings or we send them to some trainings, XML publishing, it's new for us. So we have to, to have this um, new knowledge too. So we go to other trainings and have the um, the knowledge there and then we go to others to train them so we have uh, a little bit the train the trainer system super thank you very much a uh, question from colette uh, what do you actually mean by library publishing and i think there's a standard textbook answer but this is a very interesting sort of philosophical question uh, so maybe this will be our last question uh, before the poll but maybe if if uh, in a couple of sentences uh, our presenters want to uh, define what they see as library publishing. So Ursula, maybe I'll just ask you to, what, what, what is your sense of library publishing? And I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but it's an interesting uh, question that goes to the heart of today's activities. Yeah, that's really good. Um, we understand we are the, uh, the same or easily the same like a commercial publishing house, but we really have the fair prizes. We have to have some prizes. We don't, um, can publish without costs, but uh, we're really interested in open access. And this is our main point, point that we um, try to work with scientists, with researchers, and uh, we only want to publish uh, and to make the results from them open so that all the people in all over the world can see them and recognize them. Thank you. Uh, Ngozi, Katerina, Gia, uh, please. Yes, uh, uh, I think I think the publishing is, uh, the, uh, we can say that library is publishing one, when uh, it ju not just digitalized something and put it, uh, uh, making a copy of it, but when we have the um, strong editorial process, when, uh, uh, when there is a team who is working on the text corrections and who is responsible for the quality of the final uh, product. So in this case, we are counting that this library has uh, the uh, publishing activity. So editorial process and uh, layout and pre press process is one uh, is most important for my understanding of library publishing. Thank you, uh, Ngozi. Yeah, um, let, me, let me come this way. First of all, let's us understand what publishing is. Now, publishing is the art of bringing knowledge in a format that one can be able to assess them, read them on one's own. Now, library publishing, on the other hand, has to do with a situation where library involves itself in the production of knowledge, either in a book format. And what it entails is that instead of asking known publishers to do our publishing work for us, we do those things ourselves. So library publishing is a situation where the library, rather than asking vendors or asking publishers, well-known publishers to publish their work, engage in the publishing of those knowledge themselves. 
they carry out all the activities that are involved in the publishing of a work by themselves and not subletting them out to anybody that they will have to pay at the end of the day. That is in a sim the simple way I can put it. I think, I think that's a great definition. Uh, Gia, if you have something to add uh, very quickly before we, we go to the poll. Okay, thank you. Um, for us, publishing is actually providing access to content to all patrons, especially in the community that we serve to, which is open access also and free from barriers because it's part of our public service mandate. So that's it. Wonderful, thank you. That's that's very succinct, uh, but also very clear. Uh, so we're just going to move on to a poll and and uh, also an opportunity for um, uh, for people to complete the poll, but maybe also get a glass of water, uh, uh, do uh, other things for about five minutes. Uh, I just see there's a few other questions that have come in, and and maybe we'll get to those uh, uh, shortly uh, or in the second uh, Q and A period. So uh, the poll is now in progress. Jane, do you want to uh, announce a time that we should uh, come back and we'll begin again? So if we begin begin again in about 20, at about 20 past? 20 minutes sure, past? That sounds good, yep. Just a few more minutes. We have one more question uh, in the question and answer form. Maybe we could discuss it while uh, waiting for answering. Sure, uh, we just, give me two seconds here. So a uh, question uh, from uh, Happiness, uh, and it speaks to uh, Dr. Ngozi's, uh, Ngozi's presentation. Um, does she mean that all librarians uh, should study publishing in order to publish ourselves? No, you don't need to publish, to study publishing before you can be able to publish. But you can avail yourself the opportunity of acquiring basic publishing skills like you do with several other technological skills. 
once you get those skills, you can take off from there. You don't need to go to study publishing before you can be able to publish, no. Thanks, I think that's a, that's a very good answer. And I think it speaks to uh, something that Ursula brought up as well about uh, skill acquisition and, and training the trainer. So very much a, uh, a series of, of ongoing skill development. There is a comment in the chat um, about the questionnaire. I think the second question should have been allowed to accommodate more than one answer. Uh, could we comment on this? Sorry, I, we can't actually see the uh, the other answers. There are other answers there. Oh, here we are, you can move down the side. <laughs> so. Uh, so we also have a comment um, from Alexander who says that uh, to illustrate how challenging it is to establish semantic consensus and a stable playing field in terms of operational scope, uh, professional credibility and clarity of identity, some traditional publishers, for example, misleading you use the term library publishing to ghettoize what's happening in libraries that are in the business of scholarly publishing. Uh, I think that's a very interesting comment because I think uh, for those of us who who have a foot uh, in in both scholarly pub uh, um, traditional publishing, uh, university press publishing, uh, and library publishing, that there there sometimes can be a a, a sense that uh, library publishing can be slipshod or um, casual, uh, and and uh, that uh, there is I think there's there's still much uh, work that that uh, uh, needs to be done to. Uh, harmonize uh, these these two worlds, and there is a lot of work, great work being done already by the Library Publishing Coalition, uh, the Association of University Presses, and I think events like this uh, are, are working in, in that direction as well towards that goal. I don't know if any of the other uh, anyone else uh, has any comment on that. Okay, I'm going to end the poll here and um, we'll revisit it then at the end of our webinar. So, um, so, um, so welcome back to the second part of our webinar, which focuses on collaborations in library publishing. And our first speakers in this section are Safat Babi, Baba Pala, Nazan Akdogan and Selin uh, Jan uh, Jamegil from the Nalufer Municipality in Turkey. And they're going to speak about the Yilmaz Akeluch City Research um, Awards and Publications. Um, and this is a library publishing example from Turkey. So thank you. Hello, everyone um, from Turkey. Uh, to all of our colleagues and uh, all of the attendees. Uh, I will talk today on behalf of my library director, uh, Mrs. Shafak Pala, and the project supervisor, Mrs. Nazan Akdoğan. Uh, and I will talk about one of our projects that includes publishing as a major phase of the whole process. And it is called the Ilmaz Akkalaj City Research Awards and Publications, a library publishing example from Turkey. But first, let me uh, give you a brief information about Nilüfer Municipality Libraries. And first, of course, about Nilüfer. It's the newest district of Turkey's um, uh, fourth biggest city, Bursa. Uh, the population is around 400, 
65,000 according to the latest data. And we have been providing library service services since the opening of Akkalich Library in 2007. Uh, we have six libraries operating, uh, including one children's library and one mobile library. And also we operate two writers' residence that hosts writers, academicians, researchers, poets all around the world, from all around the world. So last year, uh, 655,000 people visited our libraries and participated in the events and workshops we held throughout the year. And now all of the libraries have more than um, 46,000 members in total. So what about Yilmaz Akkalic and Akkalic Library? Uh, Akkalic Library is Nilüfer's first library and it is named after a renowned city researcher, re researcher Yilmaz Akkalic. He was a prominent journalist, a writer and a city researcher. After he decided to donate his personal library, but on, with only one condition, which was uh, to be used as a, to be used in a public library. So upon that, uh, he donated his personal library to Bursa Association of Journalists uh, and Nilüfer Municipality and Akkalic family. We plan to use these donations in a library which was named after him. Before his passing away on April 28, in 2010, he wrote several research books on Bursa's history. They are um they are very um have to say very good and detailed and published several magazines focused on the city of bursa so uh yilmaz Akkalis city research award uh, gets gets uh, its name from him uh, after his passing away bursa association of journalists Akkalic family and nilifar municipality decided to hold the research award to honor his name, establish a research culture among the residents of Bursa and encourage researchers to focus on the city of Bursa. So we have been holding, uh, we have been holding this um, awards annually since 2011. And the project stakeholders are Bursa Association of Journalists, Akkalic family themselves, Bursa Union of Academic Associations and related NGOs. So academic researchers, which are doctoral and master theses that, that uh, are approved from the Institute and non-academic research studies that focus on geographical and physical features and bring light on cultural and economical history of Bursa are admit admitted to the award and the amount is 5,000 Turkish Liras for each uh, winner study. About the application and selection process, uh, the pro application process continues for three months and we prepare and send some letters, also emails and, you know, we, we work with national press and we use uh, public um, demonstrations and everything. And in January, the selection process starts. Uh, the committee of selection consists of seven members, which are four academicians, a member of Bursa Association of Journalists, a member of Akkalic family, and a member of, uh, and a member from Nilüfer Municipality Libraries. Studies which focus on Bursa's uh, natural and cultural assets, historical, physical, social, economic backgrounds are selected. Uh, a doc usually, in general, we publish a doctoral thesis, a master's thesis, and a non-academic study, uh, study uh, but sometimes the committee can decide to publish another uh, study as well. So before, the this publishing process starts applicants sign a contract that gives permission to to the municipality to use their material for publishing purposes and we can use it for five years 
About the publishing process, I can say we worked, we work with an experienced editor. We outsource these services. Uh, also, an invitation for tender is issued by the municipality for a qualified publishing house. I mean, printing house. The editor works closely with the author and the printing house and manages the publishing process together with a member from our libraries. Um, and publish, we, we share uh, these books um, first on the day of the award ceremony, which is 28th of April, the day Mr. Akulic passed away. You can see here one of our books uh, about Bursa's immigration history written by two academicians. About the distribution, I can say we, um, we sent a copy of each published study to public and academic libraries, university libraries, related NGOs and, and academic trade unions in Turkey and sometimes uh, if related political parties uh, and via the national postal service, we sent them free of charge and last year, for example, we distributed um, two, uh, 226 books, <laughs> sorry. Also, uh, we distribute them free of charge in Bursa's annual book fair to the people that are interested in the project. So we, um, as of today, we published, we have um, published 33 books, which focus on Bursa's uh, historical background and also economical background and ETC. Uh, we also published some of Yilmaz Akılıç's researchers and uh, research and articles too. So uh, I can say that interest in the award have grown over time. For example, the first time we held this award, uh, only 16 researchers on Bursa were uh, research applied. However, there has been um, 56 applications to this year's award, and we will publish four more books in April 2021. Uh, as for our experiences, as a municipal library, we only publish books which are a part of our projects and events and um, as, as outcomes of our projects. And we believe that public libraries uh, does not bear a responsibility to act like a publishing house um, and nor their, nor their organizational structure could fit into the concept. Uh, however, in order to inform and attract wider audiences about what libraries do, what, what are their fields of work, um, and also for uh, trusted and well-studied information, library publishing is a very important tool. So thanks to Yilmaz Akli City Awards and publications, we have been able to reach many researchers, many academicians, students, institutions, and we were able to provide them trusted, well-studied sources of information. So um, we believe that we also honor Yilmaz Akli and his legacy. And one difficulty we face during the publishing process is the distribution because our libraries are uh, a part of the local government and we give public service so we cannot put a price on our books. Uh, and thus we cannot use traditional distribution networks of commercial publishing houses. And this can mean to reach a smaller audience than we actually could um, because we cannot use their networks. But we always had the chance um, to share, our, share the outcomes as a publication with our colleagues and with the public. So thank you. Um, and here you can see Yilmaz Akulic's wonderful <laughs> sentence. And Thank you for your interest in our presentation. Thank you so much, Selen. That was that was so interesting. Thank you, and to your colleagues as well. So, um, 
the, uh, Dr. Katrin Gams and Dr. Agnieszka Venninger from the Freie Universität Berlin will now present on library publishing and editors, a promising partnership built on open access. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. I hope it's going to work. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Does it look okay? Maybe you should uh, could start presenting a presenter mode somewhere. But this works fine as well, I think. Uh, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> it, I think it looks quite good. Yeah, just proceed. Is it okay for you, yes. <laughs> Catherine? Yes. Okay. okay. Great. So, well, let's thanks. do, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. We are happy to be here today. And we would like to talk today about uh, um, library publishing and editors uh, would like to discuss the issue of a promising partnership built on open access. And um, we are the speakers. Katrin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, Katrin Gans from uh, Hamburg, Germany and Berlin as well. I'm a social scientist focusing, focusing on intersectionality and digital culture. And I've had actually the pleasure to work on in a project uh, concerning the open access transformation and gender studies in the last couple of years at Freie Universität Berlin. And I'm also an editor of Open Gender Journal and can therefore um, add the perspective of an editor working together with a library publisher or a library that um, fosters publishing to our discussion today. And my name is Agnieszka Wenninger and I represent the library pass. I'm, uh, I used to work at, uh, as an open access officer at Freie Universität Berlin and now I'm based uh, with an open access Bureau Berlin since uh, June this year, but still I'm going to uh, talk about e-publishing activities at our university. And um, to begin, I just wanted to remind everyone that in academia, everybody agrees on that publishing is an integral part of the scholarly practice. However, just how much scientists should be involved in publishing and under what conditions is an open question. Um, should scientists work as editorial board members and peer reviewers um, and leave all the rest to the big publishers who make a lot of money from scientific publishing? Or should we take matters in our own hands? And the idea of uh, Scala-Let is um, actually defined by Sam Moore as publishing managed by scholars with a focus on non-commercial, experimental and col collaborative practices. This entails developing new workflows, formats and ways of quality assurance that are geared to the needs of the scientific community. Because publishing is first and foremost a way of disseminating knowledge and uh, community building also, and not a means of uh, generating profit in, in our view. With the scholar-led approach, journals like Open Gender Journal, where I, I work as an, as an editor, are taking up an active role in challenging the current publication system. Next, uh, next slide, please. The Open Gender Journal has been published. Um, sorry. <laughs> has been I'm published. sorry. <laughs> too fast. The Open Gender Journal has been published by the uh, German Gender Studies Association, which is kind of a very small learned society together with three university-based gender studies research centers since 2017. So we are quite new and we publish research articles, review articles and discussion papers in German and English. We have a publishing uh, schedule on a rolling basis instead of a thematic special issues like um, traditional journals do. And I'd say our most important mission at present is uh, being a showcase for open access best practice to strengthen open access literacy in the community of gender studies scholar in Germany and other German speaking countries. Um, 
And with this in mind, we are very happy that we have just been awarded the uh, Directory of Open Access Journal seal of approval this week, uh, which indicates a high level of openness, adherence to best practice and high publishing standards. Um, my impression is that many in our community really benefit from this, including also publishers um, or editorial board members of traditional uh, journals that are not open access and appear at uh, regular publishing houses. We are able to do all this because we really make use of the open journal systems um, software uh, published by PKP. Um, we have a workflow that is fully integrated into OGS uh, and we do that with the support of the Center for Digital Systems at Freie Universität Berlin. And here I hand over to Agnieszka. Thank you. Uh, Center for Digital Systems at, uh, Freie at the University Library of the Freie Universität Berlin has been providing um, open access uh, support to the publishing activities um, by our university researchers, but also to external partners uh, for more than a, deca a decade, since 2008 actually, and we uh, provide uh, software solutions for scholar-led uh, publication activities um, with um, OGS software, but we, we also provide uh, support for publishing of monographs, facilitating in particular the establishment of a uh, book series with the help of another open, uh, open software um, system, Open Monograph Press. And currently we have, um, uh, we provide uh, support to over 30 journals. Um, around one third of them um, is based at our uni university and those are the journals edited by our own researchers. Um, the journals hosted by, by CEDIS uh, are mainly in the field of humanities and social sciences. Uh, and the support services are free of charge to researchers affiliated with um, Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, we also work, as I previously mentioned, with um, external academic uh, partners, with academic institutions, and then the services are provided at a uh, cost base. Of course, we have um, we collaborate, um, and our very successful collaboration um, is, for instance, the collaboration with Open Journal. Uh, um, uh, Katrin presented uh, Open Gender Journal. Katrin presented to you um, previously, um, and so we cooperate with editorial staff members, but we also cooperate with public knowledge project. And um, furthermore, we cooperate within, uh, within Germany with other hosting providers in, uh, in uh, German speaking countries. For instance, we took part in a, in a, a project supported by the German uh, Research Foundation, which was called OGS Net Project, focusing especially on the uh, German needs of the OGS uh, community. Um, uh, what, uh, what do we actually uh, offer to our journal editors. Um, um, our assistance um, uh, starts already in the planning phase of the journal, so we uh, provide ass assistance uh, while setting up the open access journal, perhaps also in the um, advice um, what, kind of, um, what kind of direction the journal should take, uh, why should the journal uh, flip should the journal look for a um, commercial partner can we support the journal um, and of course we provide software support we provide initial installation and operation of the uh, technical platform of the journal and uh, of course we also introduce the journal staff uh, to the uh, various options of how to use OGS at the journal platform and uh, um, we also provide ongoing um, assistance during the journal platform operation. We also, uh, together with the library, provide uh, long-term archiving via our repository uh, and um, the visibility uh, to uh, the content uh, via help, for instance, while um, indexing for, um, uh, for um, directory of open access journals. We provide uh, consultancy on that. 
Um, we also provide training of the editorial staff, especially in the beginning, in the initial phase of the journal operation. This all sounds very nice and very encouraging. However, we see that there are also challenges uh, and uh, a further potential to improve and enhance this partnership. So, of course, uh, researchers and editors and editorial trained teams operating uh, the OGS journals are responsible for the content. This is uh, their main role. But who uh, one could ask the question, who takes care of all the rest? And of course, we also ask ourselves this question. We have um, extensive discussions with the journal editors and uh, drawing on our experience and working with the journal, uh, journal um, editorial teams, we see that there is room for, for a division of labor, um, as although particular uh, journals might, might have um, different, uh, different um, challenges and demands, still there are um, many needs that are shared. Um, for instance, pertaining to uh, layout, uh, proofreading, indexing, archiving, um, community services. So there is need for libraries to offer further support, enhanced support to the scholar-led publishing. Um, for instance, uh, concerning copyright issues, workflows, perhaps also assistance with implementing innovations such as old metrics or uh, helping editors to, in, uh, to introduce them to, to software, to enhance software proficiency, uh, to help them with um, also introducing the new staff uh, to the software. And of course, uh, we see also a great need to uh, facilitate the community services, especially in the field of networking among the uh, journal editors. And there I hand over to uh, Catherine. Yeah, with that aside, all those challenges Agnieszka mentioned, um, I wanted to con conclude by saying that from my point of view as an editor, the library really is an integral part of the network of scholars in scholar-led uh, scholar publishing. So library publishing and scholar-led publishing really go hand in hand here. Fostering biodiversity, community building, knowledge transfer, skill sharing and development and innovation and publishing are really the goals that we both share in this partnership. And it's um, <clears throat> absolutely worth addressing the challenges Agnieszka mentioned because together we can make a small difference in overcoming the big challenges in the publishing systems that we as scientists are also uh, confronted with every day. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, we look forward to your questions. I stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Katrine and uh, Agnieszka. That was, that was fascinating. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you. Um, our final speakers now are Dr. Jason Coleman and Dr. Karen Downing from the University of Michigan. And their presentation, co-written by uh, um, Dr. William Lopez, is Collaboration and Commitment Publishing Diverse Academic Scholarship for the Public Good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, all right, well, thank you so much for including us in this really interesting program. Um, today, we are going to talk about the institutional context that led to our publishing collaboration the stakeholders involved, the outcomes. Um, we're gonna share the actual imprint and uh, the lessons that we learned. And um, this is Jason and I. Okay, so um, we've got two statements here about commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. On the left is the library statement, and on the right is the National Center for Institutional Diversities statement. And um, at the University of Michigan, our dedication to academic excellence for the public good is inseparable from our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. From the president and trustees of the university down to individual units within the library um, and individual people, these co-commitments are part of the fabric of the university. 
Because of the library's emphasis on DEI, both Jason and I have yearly goals associated with DEI. And um, this collaboration that we're presenting was a great way to achieve the, um, those diversity goals. So the National Center for Institutional Diversity, NCID, is a centrally funded research center that is housed in the university's School of Education and demonstrates, it's one way of demonstrating the university's commitment to DEI research. It's a U of M, University of Michigan funded research incubator, but its reach is national with over 1000 faculty scholars in its network. And as the education librarian, I work extensively with NCID and I'm also as a diversity researcher, I'm part of that diversity network. So NCID provides funding for research to these scholars. It, it issues calls for proposals. It funds postdoctoral fellows and faculty fellows as well. So at the same time, as we are showing and demonstrating our commitment to DEI, we also have a presidential initiative to make the wealth of scholarship we produce at the university more accessible to the public. We are a publicly funded university and we have vast expertise that can help provide solutions to societal problems. So you see here the president's statement on public scholarship and also Michigan Publishing Services statement on uh, increasing the visibility and impact of scholarship. So these two areas of emphasis were in my mind when I asked Jason if he would be interested in partnering up to help the NCID increase the vis visibility of their diversity research. So not only was he enthusiastic about the partnership, but he brought his vast knowledge and context of working with other groups and projects to the table and made this new imprint possible. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. Thanks, Karen. So um, in this diagram, just briefly, the blue lines are new relationships that we created because of this partnership. Black lines are existing ones. Karen was already an NCID diversity scholar and she'd been consulting with them uh, before this happened. But when she reached out to me about the uh, possibility of starting a publishing program with NCID, I was really excited because this three-way partnership seemed like a really good model for us and one we might be able to replicate elsewhere on campus. We started off with an initial meeting uh, with the NCID director and our staff members where we discussed the needs of NCID. And essentially they were looking for a way to formalize the way they were publishing their own research outputs and to make sure that all this important work they were doing was preserved for the long term and was made available in the information supply chain. Um, this is right in our area of expertise at Michigan Publishing Services. So we worked with NCID and with Karen to write a proposal which they submitted to our own approval group which is an internal group of uh, managers here at Michigan Publishing who look at all potential collaborations on campus and then report out to the Associate University Librarian for Publishing and the Faculty Senate on what they're doing twice a year. Um, next slide, please, Karen. So the proposal that came to us was for a publishing imprint, um, which means that the NCID can publish all kinds of stuff with us, journals and books, digital projects. But the first publication that, to come along in this imprint was called Currents. And it's, it's a peer reviewed journal that translates DEI scholarship to a format that can have a more, a broader public impact. And so the journal's still new, but they're encouraging signs that it's reaching a broader audience than NCID could have alone. For instance, our analytics data tells us that the journal's being read not only in North America, although that's the primary audience, the US and Canada, but also in nearly every country in the EU, in Great Britain, in China, in India, Australia, Brazil, Argentina, New Zealand. Uh, South Africa, Philippines, and Kenya, just those are the top sources of traffic. So we're seeing a lot of reading going on all over the world. And there's no way that NCID could have done this without, uh, without the library. So it's really exciting. We're also using altmetric.com. And we can see there that some of the articles in the journal are being uh, discussed extensively in social media. So that's exciting too. So we're really pleased with this result so far. And we're talking with NCID right now about starting up some additional publications under the imprint would reach different audiences. 
I think I can speak for Karen when I say that we both believe this partnership is an excellent model for others we could build together on campus with other centers and departments and, and schools and colleges. Uh, with Michigan Publishing working directly with subject librarians, uh, they can help connect us with all the various and interesting work that's happening on campus. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So just to wrap up, here's an example article from, from the publication. You can see how it's trying to um, cast the scholarship in an accessible format for public engagement. Um, and a couple of lessons we've learned. Uh, first, existing relationships can be the conduit to really great new projects. That's what happened here, and I'd love to do it more often. Sometimes we build too many silos around our departments in the library. And secondly, once we start a conversation, we need to make sure we're really clear about roles and expectations for everybody. And the proposal process really helped us with that. It forces us to really. And I'd recommend that all library publishers do something similar if they can. We actually borrowed a lot of this from the University of Minnesota Library, our friends there. They've done great work on proposals. So don't be afraid to talk to your peers and, and borrow. And finally, build ways to communicate the impact of your library publishing work back to the people who fund it. Tools like Google Analytics and Altmetrics help us tell the story of how the, um, the work that our campus partners publish with us is really used, how it's read, and how it impacts the communities that we serve. And having this sort of data really backs up our argument that library publishing is worthy of institutional support. So that's about it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you both. That was, that was really fantastic. Um, so um, I'm going to now hand over to Jeffrey again, who's going to manage the Q&A session for, for this panel. Thank you both. Sure, thanks, Jane. So uh, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A before I pass it over to uh, Jim O'Donnell. Uh, so a question uh, to our colleagues from the Free University, a uh, question from Lars. Uh, his question is uh, that uh, his, his institution offers, offers the same services as you, uh, but they have a demand for more editorial services uh, for the editors. Uh, and wondering if, if uh, that's the same for uh, Katrin and uh, Agnieszka. Catherine, would you like to, um, uh, sure. to answer this question because you represent the editorial side? Yeah, uh, sure. And uh, I'd say my, my answer from the editorial side is absolutely yes, because um, we have to do lots of things ourselves. For example, typesetting is one task that we have to do. And uh, as you can imagine, um, it's nothing, uh, typesetting is something we, that we all have not learned how to do. It's uh, basically like getting, getting to know InDesign and then trying your best uh, to uh, really have a layout in the end that uh, works and uh, is accessible, et cetera. And that should, uh, could be something um, that uh, uh, could be done by a library editor, absolutely. Um, there sure are other examples as well. Um, it's interesting that uh, my colleagues that um, work for journals that are published at uh, regular publishing houses often experience the same thing. Maybe it's not typesetting, but sure, proofreading and marketing and lots of uh, tasks that really fall in the hands of the editors. and. Um, here, I don't, it's not really a disadvantage working together with a library publisher like CEDIS, who really focuses on the hosting. But um, in my ideal world, um, we could uh, make use of uh, more um, of those services in the future. And yeah. it's always interesting to think how to um, like structure the uh, finances uh, to be able to do so for such institutions. Yeah, perhaps I could uh, I could add on that that libraries, of course, have an important role to play here. However, there might be uh, still need for more stuff and perhaps for new uh, or other uh, profiles and skills to better face those challenges the editors uh, uh, experience. So we might need um, perhaps uh, perhaps to accommodate. Uh, to the sure. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Reggie had a question uh, in the chat, uh, and I think again for uh, for uh, Katrin and Agnieszka. Uh, and he asks, when you publish a number of journals, do you use one instance and then split that instance among a number of journals? Or uh, is there an instance for each journal, an independent in instance for every journal? And I think you mean the inst the OJS, the Open Gen Journal. I imagine, yeah, I, I, instance, I believe that's, yeah. that's the question. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, it's individual instances for, for each journal, but um, there are some things that we all have in common. For example, we can like use the, the same plugins that are pre-vetted by the administrative staff at uh, CELIS. So yeah. they use different instances, but mm -hmm. uh, some things are the same. Yeah, Great. thanks very much. Uh, other questions uh, for uh, our colleagues from Germany or for uh, Karen and, and Jason? Or any other questions that, uh, that have bubbled up uh, since uh, uh, the start of the, the session earlier? Uh, we have a comment from Michael, uh, who says that publishing is an art. It is also a matter of, of interest. Uh, and once you develop a passion for it, uh, you'll be fine uh, doing it yourself as it, it is, as it is supposed to be. So uh, thank you, Michael. I think that's a very, very nice philosophical approach uh, to approaching uh, uh, this kind of work. So thank you very much. So maybe a question uh, for, for Jason and, and Karen. Um, and I know that uh, I've, I've spoken to Jason in the past and, and uh, his work uh, is within Michigan Publishing uh, that uh, reports to an associate university librarian uh, and Karen uh, has a, a library appointment. Uh, can you speak to um, uh, what seems to me a really interesting model uh, for scholarly publishing writ large uh, that, that really speaks to an interesting um, uh, university press library publishing kind of uh, hybrid model that is, that is uh, in some ways uh, unique uh, in North America. Um, so me, I, me I can say, oh, you wanna go first, Jason? Go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanna say that um, having, having our Michigan Publishing and in particular Michigan Publishing Services that Jason leads um, as, as colleagues and seeing their, their willingness and eagerness to partner with us as subject specialists gives me an added arrow in my quiver, so to speak, when I go and reach out to the faculty and the um, students at the School of Education. It's something that really catches their attention um, in ways that other things don't necessarily. And so um, having these kinds of partnerships and colleagues is, is really, really important. And it makes all of us look really great at the library. Yeah, I agree with that, Karen. It's really great to have the, the relationships with all the subject librarians because that brings a lot of projects our way in, at publishing services. We have we don't have a unique structure by any means, but you know, more than um, twenty five percent right of American university presses report to libraries today, and including ours. So we have the University of Michigan Press. We have Michigan Publishing Services, and then we have our institutional repository, Deep Blue. And each one of them has its own mission and its own, um, its own audience and the, uh, its own services that it provides to our campus community. Um, but we have to work really flexibly with our colleagues in positions like subject librarianships so that we can help our, our campus community to use those services and just to discover them, you know, um, to find out that we exist. Thanks very much. Uh, it's it's a it's a really interesting model, and I think one that uh, that many of us can uh, can learn a great deal from. Uh, 
Uh, I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, as, as Jane said at the beginning, we'll be sharing slides and videos. So if people do have questions afterwards, there'll be a way to contact individuals. Uh, Jane, I don't know if, if I should pass it over to you or if I should pass it over to Jim or, or how would you like to proceed? Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll take it and uh, just finally, thanks very much, Jeffrey, by the way, and thanks to all the speakers. That was such an interesting session. Um, so finally, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jim O'Donnell from Arizona State University, and he's going to deliver some closing remarks, including our poll results. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jane. And I will say good morning, everybody, because it's still morning here in Arizona, though I realize some of you are more advanced than we are in your, uh, in your experience of time. Um, I want to begin by thanking and congratulating everybody who has participated in this uh, in this presentation. I'm sorry that we couldn't do it in Dublin a couple of months ago, uh, but we will uh, we will gather again at the Library World Library and Information Conference soon uh, soon enough. Um, I have just a very few closing remarks, but I thought I would start uh, by uh, responding to a request I had to report the results of the survey that was taken at. Uh, at the mid period. Uh, here it pops up on screen. Um, you'll see that when asked about the impact of COVID on the library publishing program, the quite good news is that 73%, questions one and four together, have sustained or improved their ability to engage in this area. Uh, and 26% report declines either due to distraction by other responsibilities or with budgetary problems. Um, I wish that 26% were smaller, but given the circumstances of the time, um, I think that's actually a better number than I was expecting uh, when we did this. Um, at, then under the category of challenges limiting the delivery of a library publishing service, I'm not sure we can see all the lines there, and several people said that it was hard to pick just one. But the final numbers showed again the same number 47%, this time not so positive. Uh, the 47% was people who are having challenges with uh, a library publishing program due to a lack of institutional support. And I think that's a lesson to us all that uh, we should be working hard with our institutions to make them understand what we do and why we do it. Uh, the other largest category of obstacle was time constraints. That's also a resource question. If we had more, more professionals working on, uh, on these issues, um, we'd certainly be in a better position to, uh, to follow them up. Um, the, less, the third category, lack of knowledge, I think that's fixable, uh, of know-how, and then challenges with IT infrastructure and lack of software get you down to about 5%. Uh, to about 5% each. I think that's all very interesting. And thank you for posting the results there. Um, we, can, uh, we can let them go off screen now. Um, I want to conclude just by observing that there's a connection uh, between a theme that emerged throughout so much of the program and the question of gaining uh, resources. Um, I want to go back to one of the slides of uh, Gia Cabria back at the very beginning in her presentation from the Philippines where she said they emphasize sustainability, scalability, and visibility. And those are surely goals for us to, uh, to have in front of ourselves. Um, we do this, as is very clear from all the presentations, by finding either new audiences or new subjects or some combination of both, by being real innovators in the way information is produced and consumed uh, in our libraries and for the communities that we, uh, that we serve. And that's encouraging. But I was also struck, um, and it was nice to have the presentation from Michigan at the very end that foregrounded the issue, struck by the way so many of these presentations speak to how libraries engaged on their publishing programs are in fact supporting diversity and inclusiveness of disciplines of communities of points of view that are not easily or automatically represented in the mainstream commercial for-profit sector um, of our uh, of our publishing um, you can see that from the places people came um, i am an ancient historian and was was happy and pleased to be on a zoom call with someone from bursa in turkey a very ancient and eminent and important city 
we got a lovely picture there of how the library publishing enables us to uh, to reach into uh, domains of public knowledge and public contribution that might not otherwise be so readily uh, so readily uh, presented. Um, the way in which um, library information and scholarly information and library resources um, are translated into the worlds of Russia and Nigeria. Uh, very important and very important to have the way voices are represented. Uh, the last one I'll mention, but there I could have talked this way in detail about all of them, um, is the work being done by our colleagues from Fry Universität, where in the uh, there's the combination of a cutting edge field of research in gender studies, um, a cutting edge way to disseminate research uh, that is open access, and just the enthusiasm and the commitment that you can see uh, coming from uh, the people who have participated in this. Um, I think that actually, that those reflections, I mean to help us think about how we can address the underlying problem. Our institutions, our cultures are more aware than ever before of the importance of um, social equity, social justice, and emphasizing in our work diversity and inclusion. Uh, we need to be telling our provosts, our rectors, our uh, underlying funding organizations, just how much we can do to support that kind of work and change the conversation, change the discourse of our societies uh, to be more genuinely inclusive and representative of, uh, of populations. Um, I don't think we're going to be returning to anything like normal soon. I hope to see all of you in Rotterdam next summer. Uh, next, sorry, not next summer. Uh, but uh, but uh, but at the next World Library and Information Congress. Uh, but I think the pandemic, you know, the consequent economic impacts, the consequent political impacts are going to make us work in this space in which we, along with many allies, will have to work very hard to uh, to distribute information, to reach audiences, to support education, to support research, and to do so in a way that is as genuinely inclusive as this panel has been. So I'm, I'm impressed and pleased by this work. Um, I want to thank our, uh, our co-organizers, Anne Okerson, who unfortunately had technology challenges and can't be here uh, today, Reggie Raju, uh, and of course our gracious host from uh, in many settings of library publishing uh, uh, special interest group, uh, Jane Buggle and her colleagues for making this happen. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank the present presenters, especially for their work, and thank all of you who work in library publishing uh, and this world of uh, this world of you know, improving information access, community, and culture uh, for your time and presentation this morning. Uh, those are my remarks. I think maybe Jane gets the last word. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Jim, and thank you to everybody. This has been a real, really interesting um, um, afternoon session for me, anyway. And uh, and we'll be loading up the the recordings and the slides onto the IFLA space soon. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Really well done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. That was superb. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Reggie, thank you. Jane, take care. Great to see you. Thanks a million, Jim. See you in Dublin soon, I hope. I hope indeed. Yes. Yep. Soon, soon. Take care. <laughs>